So let's talk about authentication and let's talk about secure access to the enterprise grade Wi-Fi networks. There are a couple of ways of how you can authenticate a wireless client to your network. Uh, you can use an open authentication, you can couple that with a captive web portal for example, but that means there's no encryption, there's no over the air encryption of the client traffic. You can use WPA2 or WPA3 personal which implies you're using a pre-shared key for all the client devices, but then that sort of authentication is susceptible to offline dictionary attacks and also once the key is compromised it's easy to decrypt all clients traffic uh, by an attacker. So for that reason the most secure way of authenticating and connecting a wireless client to an enterprise grade Wi-Fi network is 802.1x. 802.1x is a security framework that provides secure way of authenticating users and devices uh, and also offers multiple ways and multiple credentials to be used to achieve that goal. And it uses a protocol called EAP which is extensible authentication protocol and that protocol allows for the use of username and passwords that would be sitting in your uh, Active Directory or that are part of your domain. You could use digital certificates or you can use things like generated token codes um, and similar. So it, it's a very comprehensive framework. However, it is much more difficult to deploy and maintain compared to the other authentication methods that we just discussed. So how does 802.1x heap work? Well, you need a couple of things. First of all, you need a radius server that that radio server needs to be able to talk to, to a user database. Now, that user database could be sitting on the radio server itself, but more commonly, that user database sits outside the radio server uh, in an Active Directory server or something similar. And the protocol used to communicate between the radio server and that user database is called LDAP. The second thing you need is you need to have certificates. So you need to have digital certificates to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. And the certificates need to be sitting in two places. There needs to be a server-side certificate sitting on the radius server which will tell the client device that this network is actually uh, valid. And there needs to be a root CA certificate. That's a certificate that was used to sign to validate the certificate on the server which will have the client device actually verify whether it's connecting to a, to a legitimate network or in case this would be a man in the middle attack uh, the certificate error would be thrown on the, on the client side and the client would be warned about not connecting to an actual uh, network that is valid. The authentication process is between the client and the radio server so it's an end-to-end -end communication between the client or a piece of software on a client device that we call a supplicant, or which is normally part of the operating system itself. And that supplicant piece of the operating system talks to the radio server on the other side, and the end-to-end -end communication is called the EAP protocol. Now, the EAP protocol is encapsulated in two ways. Over the air, between the supplicant and the access point, we use a communication mechanism called EAP over LAN and between the access point or if we were using a wired communication it would be a switch we're using the radius protocol which encapsulates the EAP protocol all the way back to the radius server. Uh, so the physical components you need for this to work is you need to have an authenticator which is either an access point or a switch in a wired scenario. You need a radius server uh, which would be sitting in a secure part of the network and then you need an authentication uh, server or a user database uh, where the user credentials actually sit. Because of the additional infrastructure used and mainly because you have to maintain server-side uh, certificates and because you have to distribute the root CA certificates to client devices, 802.1x EAP is often considered difficult or cumbersome to deploy. However, 
it is worth doing it because for an enterprise scenario, for your employees, this is the most secure way of getting people on the network, authenticating them and providing secure and encrypted communications channel. So, so far we've onboarded an access point, we've created a PSK protected SSID, uh, so a single network, we've mapped everything, including the users to VLAN 1, um, which obviously doesn't really mean a very secure deployment. So this was just to demonstrate how you can quickly uh, configure network policy and how the configuration objects work and how you can monitor your deployment. Now, let's go into a more enterprise type of a scenario. So let's go to our Corp1 network policy. So under configure network policies. Let's open it up. Go under wireless networks and we will add another wireless network. So click on add in here. And we will use WPA2, WPA3 Enterprise, or we'll use 802.1x EAP, which is the sec most secure way of connecting uh, wireless clients in an enterprise setting. And we'll call it Corp EAP. Now, in the configuration guide in here, you see it prompts us to add a radio server group. And here we have a couple of options. So you can actually use Extreme Cloud IQ as a radio server if you want. So by toggling this button, you can use Extreme Cloud IQ as a radio service, add user groups, and create username and passwords in that user groups. And the uh, protocol used between the access points and Extreme Cloud IQ is actually going to be the same protocol used for PPSK, which is encrypted radius or radius inside a TLS tunnel. So this might be useful for small organizations, organizations that can't or don't want to deploy a radio server. So you can actually leverage Extreme Cloud IQ as your radio server and as your user database and provide 802.1x out of the box. So because we said 802.1x is inherently more secure uh, than other sort of types of authentication, this gives you a very flexible and quick to deploy option of um, enterprise grade Wi-Fi. But what happens more often, environments or customers will already have an existing user database, which is normally your active directory, and that's what you want to tap into. So that's why we will add a radio server group, and we have a pre-configured radio server that's already uh, it's already synced with an Active Directory server. So we will go and add another radio server group. We will call it group one. And when it comes to radio servers, you have a couple of options. So you can use an external radio server, which is basically pointing to a radio server IP address. You can use an A3 instance, which is an extreme product and it's a NAC, so it's an it's a NAC server. You can use Extreme Networks Radio Server, which means one of the network devices, for example, an access point acts as a radio server, or you can point it to a net radio server proxy, uh, which means one of the access points or network devices acts as a radio server proxy, because the extreme wireless cloud uh, access points can actually act either as a radio server and speak directly to an active directory or as a radius proxy. Um, we'll only focus on the most common scenario for now which is using an external radius server. So uh, something like a Microsoft MPS or a free radius that's already in place and that's what we'll use. So select external radio server. We will add a new object. We'll call it radius1. We will add an IP address for that server. And we happen to know that that server is running on this particular IP address. So we'll just type that in. Okay. We'll be using default ports. Again, this may not be true in your deployment. Uh, some, the, some companies do change ports for security purposes. And we will also type in the shared secret key. We'll save the radius server. We'll save the radius group and make sure we use radius one. Okay. Now you see the radius server group object has gone green. We have all that it we need to configure. Um, what we'll do now though is w when we use any sort of um, user group or user membership type of authentication, we want to assign users to different VLANs. 
in the previous lab we just mapped everything to VLAN 1, which A, is already a management VLAN, and B, it's not secure using VLAN 1 in the first place. So what we'll do is, we will add, or actually we'll change the default user profile. So we will change the user prof uh, the default user profile to a, to a quarantine VLAN. So what we'll do is, instead of putting users into VLAN 1 by default, we'll put them into VLAN 5. So we'll create a VLAN tag. So now, if no other rules are matched, users will fall into VLAN 5 if, there's, if the authentication succeeds. And we, may, we, we made sure that this is the least open or the most uh, restricted VLAN. So by default, if, not, if nothing else is successful, if we're not successfully authenticating users in terms of uh, VLAN membership on the radio server, so if, if authentication passes but we're not getting any VLAN mappings, then users will fall into VLAN 5. And this is a best practice because you want to have the most restricted VLAN as your default VLAN. You don't want to use something that's very open or uh, do, you definitely don't want to use your management VLAN. So let's save the user profile. Now what we'll do is you will see that you have the option of apply different user profiles to various clients and groups. So we'll check the setting. And what this allows us to do is, based on the radius attributes coming in from the radius server, we'll be able to map users to different user profiles. So let's add a new user profile, which, which we'll call user profile 10. And this is going to map to VLAN 10. And we'll create another one which we will call user profile 8 and this will map to user profile 8. Now what we need is we need assignment rules. So we do have, we now have multiple VLANs, we have multiple user profiles assigned to this SSID. Uh, now we need some sort of rules to assign these VLANs uh, to each particular client device. So let's add an assignment rule. Let's call it rule 10. And down here, you can select what are you assigning this rule based on. Uh, it can be client location, MAC address, type. What we really want is a radius attribute. So we'll use the radius attributes. And there's a couple of options here. You can use uh, filter ID uh, or other radius attributes, or you can use a standard attribute value pairs supported by Extreme Wireless Cloud access points. Um, that's already configured uh, on the radius side, so we'll just use this. And if we say, if the um, tunnel private group ID equals 10, then we will map this user to VLAN 10. And similarly, so we now have this rule in here, and we're saying map user to VLAN 10 if the radius returns the attrib attribute 10 for the tunnel private group ID. We'll do the same thing in here. We'll call it rule 8, and we will map this user to VLAN 8 based on that same attribute, but with a value of 8. Okay. And again, the radius server has already been pre-configured to do this for us. Okay. You can use other radius attributes if you want to, like filter ID, you know, there's, there's a lot of options available in radio servers, but we'll just stick with the, with the default ones for now. Save. So now we have two SSIDs, one is called PSK1, the other one is called Corp EAP. And you see the, def the default VLAN is already different. And what you also see is we support 802.1x on this Corp EAP SSID. Now let's deploy the policy to our access point. You also see, because the configuration has changed in the side of Extreme Cloud IQ, you now have this audit icon uh, telling you that something's changed. We can check what the delta is. So what's different between Extreme Cloud IQ configuration and what's on the device? And you see this all EAP uh, configuration, user profile configuration, all the security things that we've configured in Extreme Cloud IQ now need to be pushed to the device. And this is the delta. Okay, and we will push the delta configuration 
so the AP won't reboot to the device. So let's do, let's just perform an update, and then we'll connect the client device. So we've pushed the configuration to our access point. We now have two SSIDs up in the air, and if we go back to manage and clients. We've also connected a client device to the Corp EAP SSID, and we used the 802.1x authentication for that. And what you can see here immediately is we now have a username. So we have a user identity. We're using that same Android device we did before. You see that the uh, VLAN is different, and the subnet that the uh, user has been assigned to is different. We have VLAN 10, and you see that the user profile assigned is user profile 10. So this is how you would map your sales, your marketing departments, or whatever type of uh, groupings that you want and you use in your company. And now, when we go under users, we see we have our first user populated in the database, and that's user one, and that's based on the authentication from the radio server. Okay, currently there's not much statistics in there, so we know that user one has one device, it's using SSID Corp EAP the, with 802.1x authentication. They're currently on uh, this floor, on this AP. And as this continues, we're going to get more uh, statistics, but you can see that the authentication source already is RADIUS. You can switch from a real-time to historical view uh, on all of these views. So let's see where what else we have in a historical view. Okay. So we previously had the same device connected to a different subnet using a different IP address. So it was in VLAN 1, PSK1, and Android. So that's what, what was happening historically. Back to real time. You see the current device connected uh, using 802.1x EAP to VLAN 10. And that is how you configure 802.1x EAP with Extreme Cloud IQ.